Today we will learn and reflect on the influential book, The Meaning of Tradition, by the leading theologian of the Second Vatican Council, Yves Congar. Yves Congar does not consult at length scriptures or the writings of the Church Fathers because the debate of scripture versus tradition originated with the Reformation, and before then there's no real distinction drawn between scripture and tradition. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources used for this video. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Scripture alone was one of Luther's slogans, the Luther who excelled at reducing complex theological arguments to simple slogans, the Luther who started the debate of Scripture versus Tradition. Not all Reformation debates were new, but the debate of Scripture versus Tradition was a new debate. Before the Reformation's theologians had never debated whether tradition was equal to Scripture. Luther was the reformer who coined the phrase Scripture alone, and also faith alone. As we see in our videos on Luther's Catechism, Luther was a genius at coining memorable phrases and slogans. The decrees of Vatican II no longer strive to be confrontational with the Protestant churches, but rather seek dialogue with them as separated brethren. No longer does the official Catholic Church seek polemic arguments on topics such as Scripture versus tradition. One of the clerics whose writings deeply influenced the decrees of Vatican II was Yves Congar, including his work on the meaning of tradition. He examined what the Church Fathers taught us about tradition throughout Church history. Now, the New Testament does have several verses on the role of tradition in uh, Christian life. And there are several proof text Bible verses that appear to deny the role of tradition when quoted out of context. Such as when Jesus answered, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Also, St. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. Certainly, it is not Christian to distort either scripture or tradition in a manner that conflicts with your love of God and neighbor, but that does not mean that all tradition is condemned by scripture. Indeed, there are also Bible verses that affirm the role of traditions. And St. Paul has several verses. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition they receive from us. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Also, St. Paul exhorts, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain traditions just as I handed them on to you. In Greek, the same word translates to both teaching and tradition in English. Tradition was central to the ancient church, indeed, as it is central to all churches, as the core meaning of tradition is common practice, and all churches have an accepted method of worshiping. And one of the most ancient patristic works that was discovered after the Reformation, the Didache, revealed that the early church did develop a strong liturgical tradition early in its history. Another useful work is St. Augustine's Confessions, where St. Augustine confesses how he converted back to the Catholic faith of his mother. He describes how the sacraments were part of his life in the church, how the preachings of St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, convinced him of the truth of Christianity, and how he was baptized on Easter. The Confessions give us a rare look at how the lives of ordinary Christians were intertwined with the liturgy and the sacraments, and by the spiritual leadership of the bishops and priests, the hierarchy of the Church. St. Augustine, in his Confessions, tells us the story of Victorinus, someone who studies the Gospels and the Church Fathers, but declines to attend the services, asking, Do the walls of the Church make you a Christian? And in the words of St. Augustine, in his studies, Victorinus became resolute, he was seized by the fear that Christ might deny him before the holy angels if he was too faint-hearted to acknowledge Christ before men, and he felt himself guilty of a great crime in being ashamed of the sacraments instituted by the word of God in his lowly state. And the question of traditions versus scripture was addressed by the Council of Trent, and the Council of Trent was truly a reformed council that laid a lasting theological foundation that the Vatican II Council built upon. However, the theologians at Trent sometimes misunderstood the history of some ancient church traditions. Also, as a result of the polemic battles with Protestants afterwards, the interpretation of the Trent Council decrees became more reactionary. Even so, the decrees of Trent are an excellent starting point to determine the historical definition of tradition. 
trade and smoke, not a tradition, but many traditions, and its decrees venerate both scriptures as well as traditions concerning both faith and conduct, which have been preserved in unbroken sequence in the Catholic Church, traditions that include infant baptism. When it talks about traditions practiced in unbroken sequence, Trent refers to apostolic traditions rather than later human or ecclesiastical traditions. The Trent Decree does not separate scriptures and traditions, as both scriptures and traditions are transmitted together by Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we quote the author John O'Malley, who wrote the book on Trent that we use. Following the example of the Orthodox Fathers, the Council of Trent receives and venerates, with the same sense of loyalty and reverence, all the books of the Old and New Testament. For the one God is the author of both, together with all the traditions concerning faith and practice as coming from the mouth of Christ, or being inspired by the Holy Spirit, and preserved in continuous succession in the Catholic Church. The many decrees from Trent reaffirming the validity of the Catholic sacraments are also defenses of the value of tradition. And originally, scriptures flowed from tradition, and then the writings of the Church Fathers that form much of the traditional beliefs of the Church flowed from and commented on the scriptures. What does Yves Congar say about the meaning of tradition? He points out that the Greek word for tradition means a passing of an object, like a baton in a relay race, like the passing on of the good news from the apostles through the ages. The debate over which is more important, scripture or tradition, is absurd. The scriptures themselves were handed down to us by tradition. Most scholars argue that the Gospels developed over many decades from oral tradition, and it was not until the late 4th and early 5th century when the early church came to a consensus formed on what books could be included in the New Testament canon. Yves Congar notes that though many Protestants concede that the scriptures were handed down by tradition, that once the canon was settled, that unwritten tradition was no longer comparable to the scriptures. However, the early church fathers did not see the tradition falling away as the setting of the canon was a gradual process attested by multiple synods and the writings of many church fathers and the Greek word for paradise, paradisos, is similar to the Greek word for tradition, paradosis. Yves Concar observes, tradition or transmission is the very principle of the economy of salvation. Just as God delivered and gave up his Son for our salvation, so the good news of the gospel is delivered and transmitted through the ages through the church. Tradition includes equally the holy scriptures and also the sacraments, ecclesiastical institutions, the power of the ministry, custom, and liturgical rites, and all the elements of Christianity. If scripture was meant to transcend tradition, if the written word is so superior to the oral traditions, only written on the hearts of men who heard the good news, why didn't Jesus himself write down his teachings? St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that Christ did not teach by means of the written word because he is the absolutely perfect teacher, teaching a living message that would be handed down by the apostles through the church up to the current day. In his writings preceding Vatican II, Yves Congar wanted to open a dialogue rather than continue a diatribe opposing Protestantism. And this is challenging, as Protestants range from the nearly Catholic High Anglicans to the speaking in tongue Pentecostals. But out of necessity, Yves Congar concentrates on the middle of the road Protestants, the theology of the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Now, in his first edition of The Meaning of Tradition, Yves Congar attempted to describe the various Protestant positions in more detail. But in the latest edition, he just deleted the chapter and abandoned the attempt. There are just too many Protestant theologies to understand them all and give justice to them. By abandoning diatribes, by abandoning the proclaiming of anathemas against those who disagree with the Catholic doctrine, which had been the practice since the earliest of the ecumenical councils, the post-Vatican II Catholic Church now explicitly believes that both Catholics and Protestants can obtain salvation through the grace of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and Jews as well, I might add. By opening a dialogue, the Church teaches that we can learn from both Catholic and Protestant theologies, and this also infers that this encourages study, effort, and dedication. In the spirit of Vatican II, we should strive to view these differences as differences of emphasis rather than as differences that divide. During the many years I attended a Baptist church, I often heard the challenge, Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And many of the Baptists I knew thought this was not something that the Catholics accepted, because if they did, they would truly believe. They would convert from Catholicism to the genuine faith. And it did not help that a few of the Baptist faithful were former Catholics. Yves Congar does not deny that Catholics should have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and as Yves Congar himself states, 
The traditional Catholic view is that our relationship with God is not by nature purely individualistic or personal. Also, we are united to God personally, not merely by personal links, but also those links to the ancient sacraments, liturgy, and through the ecclesiastical framework of the Church, whose authority has been handed down through the millennia through the bishops back to Jesus and his apostles, whose teaching has been handed down by the magisterium, the writings of the Church Fathers and the Church Councils, including Vatican II, and I might add also Billy Graham and many of the Protestant pastors, down to the current day. We worship Christ both personally and as a community in the Church. Likewise, Eve Gungar asserts the Catholic conviction that Scripture can be read authentically only in the Church and according to tradition. Eve Gungar observes that the Protestant rejects what he does not find formally in the Scripture. The Catholic is unable to justify his position entirely by referring to a text, but regarding it as an element of the Christian reality he has received, he can rediscover a certain testimony in Scripture. Now, I've personally found this to be true. When reading the early church fathers in the Philokalia and the Ladder of Divine Ascent and many of the other monastic writings, you find that you come closer to the true meaning of the scriptures. Since we are imperfect, selfish creatures by nature, we all tend to distort the meaning of scripture to justify our imperfections. Now, Protestants should be commended for memorizing scripture verses, but the spiritual danger to this is that you lose the context of the entire message. Often you must read at least the chapter before and after the verse to plumb its complete meaning. We might do better to memorize instead key chapters or key psalms in their entirety. Eve Congar does not deny the importance of scripture. On the contrary, he reminds us that many of the writings of the church fathers were commentaries on scripture. And this has always been true. The decrees of the Council of Trent and Vatican II are both replete with many references and quotations from scripture. But he does push back on the extreme Lutheran slogan of Scripture alone, the Protestant theory of the sufficiency of Scripture. Another spiritual danger is justifying our own theological beliefs by proof-texting selective Bible verses that bolster our predetermined beliefs and ignoring those Bible verses that oppose our views. This proof-texting of the writings of the Church Fathers is even more problematic due to the problems of translation, transcription, and the pure volume of these writings, knowing which writings have lost the sanction of theologians. For example, in another video, we discuss how Christians should ignore the violently anti-Semitic writings of St. John Chrysostom, and he's one of the most important early Church Fathers. And we might add, Luther is the same problem. As Eve Gungar states, under the Protestant theory of the sufficiency of Scripture, Scripture is the principal or even the sole means of grace, containing all that is necessary for the Christian to learn to live the Christian life. And it is clear, explaining itself without help and needing nothing beside itself to make known God's thoughts. And the Protestant viewpoint is this, all you need to do is read the Bible by yourself and the Holy Spirit will reveal everything. And if this were true, if the ordinary Christian does not need the teachings of tradition, if the Holy Spirit alone is necessary to interpret Scripture, then why did Luther and Calvin, I might say Billy Graham, feel compelled to write volumes of commentary on the Scripture? And why did Luther feel compelled to write a catechism? And more lately, why did Billy Graham and W.L. Moody and Spurgeon and countless other preachers feel compelled to write many books on Scriptures and how to live a godly life? How can Protestants denigrate the value of Christian tradition when there's also a rich Protestant tradition to aid in their interpretation of the Holy Scriptures? And Eve Congar in his book also has some interesting observations on the traditions of the Church as they're handed down in the pronouncements of the ecumenical councils. For example, quoting Congar, the Seventh Ecumenical Council defined the question of images, appealing to tradition and linking these to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Church. When challenged whether images are idols, the response is we can review how this council consulted scripture in their decree. Since Jesus Christ was incarnated in the flesh, we can venerate images of Christ and the saints as examples to follow in our daily lives. Likewise, the Third Ecumenical Council encourages believers to venerate the Virgin Mary, Theotokos, the Mother of God. Eve Congar quotes Hugh Ronner, who's another church father of Vatican II, The Church of Mary is the history of the world. She imitates and prolongs this meditation through the centuries and will not ease until history has said its final word and asked its final question. Eve Congar also discusses the role that the liturgy plays in human tradition. We encourage our reader to read Congar for himself. We'll sample a quote. 
The Christian who participates in the liturgy is a man of peace and unified in every fiber of his human nature by the secret and powerful penetration of faith and love in his life through prayer and worship, during which he learns, on his mother's knees and without effort, the church's language, her language of faith, love, and hope, and fidelity. Eve Kangar argues that tradition is two equally important aspects, one of development and one of conservatism. These two aspects are intention, the magisterium seeks to preserve the seed of faith, as handed down by the ancient church and scriptures, but also to preserve the seed of faith the church needs to apply in its modern circumstances. The best example is the Catholic Catechism. It quotes scripture in both the Eastern and Western Church Fathers, while it offers thoughtful guidance to both the bishops and the faithful on modern problems like suicide, abortion, and marriage, while also serving as a moral compass for the faithful. And a concluding observation by Eve Congar. St. Gregory the Great teaches us, To fail to listen to the word is to fail to put it into practice in one's life. In the New Testament, to keep the word is the same as to build on the foundation that is Christ, to take root and grow in Christ. You might ask, how is the Second Vatican Council influenced by Eve Congar's observations on tradition versus scripture? Now, as we discussed in our video on the Council of Trent, the medieval popes had locked up the proceedings of the council until the 20th century, and Herbert J. Dean's History of the Council of Trent had been published only shortly before Vatican II. The initial drafts of the documents of Vatican II repeated the dualistic argument of scripture versus tradition that had been raging for centuries. But J. Dean's history revealed that the Church Fathers of Trent had not intended to argue the primacy of tradition. During the debates on De Verbum, the dogmatic constitution of divine revelation released by Vatican II, the bishops decided to turn down the heat on the traditional argument of tradition versus scripture, and instead teach that the Holy Spirit was the source of divine revelation, and that from the Holy Spirit flowed both tradition and scripture. And we, in this video, list tradition first simply because the Christian New Testament canon was not definitively settled until the 5th century. And chapter 2 of De Verbum has a readable presentation of this argument. We'll simply quote from paragraphs 9 and 10. There exists a close connection in communications between sacred tradition and sacred scripture, for both of them flowing from the same divine wellspring in a certain way merge into a unity and tend toward the same end. Both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of loyalty and reverence. And sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Before reading the decrees of Vatican II, you may want to read the works by the key theologians who played key roles in shaping the debate leading up to these decrees. And Yves Congard does as well in his work on the meaning of tradition. We also use as a source John O'Malley's book on what happened at Vatican II. While John O'Malley has a standard historical sequential view of Vatican II, this book on the documents of the Vatican II looks at the history in a slightly different way, but document by document, and so we draw on this as well. And I also want to point out, in addition to his book on Vatican II, John O'Malley has a companion series of lectures that he recorded with Learn25, which is an excellent website of lectures of Catholic professors. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.